Last year to have Wall as our John Chappelle lecturer, which is an, an honored position in the NPA. And uh, I'm just thrilled to have him back again, uh, all the way from Australia, uh, probably the world's top authority today on the whole electric universe concept, and has been for uh, at least two decades, I don't know. Um, and so it is uh, a great thrill for me and a great honor for me to introduce uh, the man who has brought uh, a lot of, you know, this whole electric universe paradigm to to challenge all of us. And uh, looks like we're going to need a little bit of time to get, I'm not sure how to set up your presentation here. So, give me a minute. Uh, I don't know how to use that. So I'll let you do it. Are you ready to go? Okay. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Walt Thornton. title slide. The Electric Universe Illuminates Recent Discoveries. And this is one of the fun aspects of um, being a pioneer in the Electric Universe model is reading all of the scientific reports that are pouring in each week and finding uh, evidence which supports the Electric Universe model or mysteries in the current paradigm which can be <clears throat> easily explained by the electric universe model. <laughs> now, just last month, in June, Science published this issue which was headlined, Mysteries of Astronomy. That uh, amazing picture there is obviously a computer generated model. It's supposed to be the model of a supernova explosion in the process of happening. I suggest that um, it is entirely fanciful. I mean it, it looks fanciful and I think that um, that's the first test. But in this uh, article or the articles that uh, surrounded this uh, subject of the mysteries of astronomy the idea of true mysteries was described as being mysteries which were not likely to be answered or solved very quickly and maybe never. And what are they? There was eight of them. What is dark energy? How hot is dark matter? Where are the missing baryons? How do stars explode? What reionized the universe? What's the source of the most energetic cosmic rays? And why is the solar system so bizarre? And why is the sun's corona so hot? And I would suggest that almost all of those mysteries are, an art are artifacts of an incorrect paradigm, the Big Bang paradigm, the gravitational of the universe. So I'll look at each one just quickly before getting on to the, uh, the subject of the two items that I suggest are easily explained by uh, the Electric Universe model and were recently published. And they appear in the uh, paper in the Proceedings of uh, NPA 19. What is dark energy? This is from the actual article itself, these are quotes. Astronomers expected that the expansion would be slowing as galaxies pull toward one another with their gravity. To their shock, they found that the expansion of the universe is accelerating as if some bizarre dark energy is stretching space. That's the other thing about a lot of this language is that when you look at it and question it, it is fundamentally meaningless. Uh, it was said the other day that uh, 
a lot of the uh, statements made in science now would not stand up to examination in a court. And I think that's quite true. And uh, Tommy Gold, I remember some years ago, suggested that there should actually be a scientific court of uh, individuals who are not from the uh, discipline that was being under investigation or was making a proposal before any claims could be made by that particular discipline. My opinion is that a lot of the language used would not stand withstand cross-examination. In fact, I don't think a lot of the cases would even make it to court. Dark energy and stretching space. The nature of dark energy is now perhaps the most profound mystery in cosmology and astrophysics, and it may remain forever so. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that this expansion, accelerated expansion, is based on the study of supernova explosions. And yet one of the mysteries in this list is what causes a supernova to explode. So here you have a discovery of accelerating, uh, so-called acceleration of the expansion of the universe based on something which is not understood. How hot is dark matter? Dark matter cannot be detected by electromagnetic radiation, therefore it is dark. In other words, it cannot be normal matter. All matter is electromagnetic in origin, or at least it functions electromagnetically, so it must be detectable. However, this is one of the definitions of dark matter. It can only be detected by its gravitational effect, but if gravity itself is also an electrical phenomenon, it cannot exist because um, the matter must respond to the gravitational force and to the electric force and be detectable by other means. Dark matter was simply invented to save gravitational models of galactic clusters and star motion within galaxies. And it's, of course it's placed where it's convenient to save the model. It is estimated to be 83% of all matter in the universe, which makes us some kind of impurity. <laughs> Hot dark matter is ultra-relativistic and is required to explain the filaments and sheets seen today. And as uh, Don has been pointing out, these filaments and sheets can be explained quite simply in terms of plasma cosmology. Where are the missing baryons? <coughs> It's not just that astronomers can't pin down dark energy and dark matter, the two invisible components that make up 95% of the cosmos, but more than half of the remaining 5% of baryonic matter, the ordinary atoms and ions that make up stars, planets, dust and gas, remains unaccounted for as well. But this is all based on a paradigm of the origin of the universe in the Big Bang. The electric universe makes no claims about origins because there is no uh, evidence for an origin in a Big Bang. Uh, one of the Sanyak Award winners, uh, who will be um, mentioned to, uh, tomorrow night in the presentations, uh, is uh, Halton Arp, the astronomer, whose life work was centered around the discovery that redshift is somehow allied to the matter in a quasar. And since quasars are shot from the centers of active galaxies, it appears that the redshift actually has more to do with the age or the youth of the object than it has to do with its actual velocity away from us. So the Big Bang and uh, its idea that uh, matter is somehow formed from energy, and yet energy must have matter to uh, manifest. Energy is embodied in matter. So you have this chicken and the egg problem, which is insoluble uh, in any paradigm that we can mention at present. So where are the missing baryons? It's a non-question. It's an artifact of an invalid paradigm. How do stars explode? And I love this one because uh, I published a peer-reviewed paper in the IEEE Plasma Sciences Journal a few years ago where I explained the uh, form of supernova 
1987A. And in that, I point out that it is in effect uh, an electrical explosion around the star which may reach down to the star itself and cause the outer layers to be stripped off. The problem for um, the present view of stars exploding is that it comes from this idea that all stars are powered internally by the same basic process, the fusion of hydrogen into helium. And as uh, Don's been pointing out in uh, his talk, uh, the electric universe model does not require external powering. There was something that Eddington himself considered in the opening pages of his uh, seminal work on the origin, or sorry, the powering of stars and the standard model of the interior of a star. And he said that um, he couldn't, there was no sign of incoming matter or anything impinging on the star which could provide the energy of the radiation of a star. And so he more or less gave up. So the question how do stars explode uh, starts with an invalid model. So many details of what goes on inside a star leading up to an explosion as well as how that explosion in unfolds remains a mystery. Initially, of course, the idea was that if the star explodes, then it should be a spherically symmetrical explosion. But what we find when we look is that our supernova explosions are bipolar events, which is not easily explained by an explosion. Many of the best computer models of supernovas fail to produce an explosion. At the end of the simulation, gravity wins the day and the star simply collapses. And uh, that's what I'd expect because you're trying to do the impossible with a model that is uh, invalid once again. So the mystery is a mystery only because you start out with the incorrect model. What reionized the universe? And this comes down to the Big Bang uh, paradigm once again. And it said, Theoretically, some 400,000 years after the Big Bang, protons and electrons cooled off enough so that they combined into atoms of neutral hydrogen. This is uh, all pure speculation. It's a once upon a time story. Uh, and it has had to be all of these ideas about the Big Bang and, and the observations that have followed, the cosmic microwave background, radiation uh, discoveries and so on, have all been uh, retrofitted to the model so that uh, it's a case that you uh, you cannot uh, lose in this situation. You can dream up anything you like. Uh, we have the uh, accelerated expansion, initial expansion to try and solve the problems of the distribution of matter in the universe and so on. So the question of what reionized the universe is another one of these non-questions. The idea is, of course, that a few hundred million years later, something had to strip the electrons off the atoms again. This is a very complicated model. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you tell you the story. <laughs> it's just ad hocery. Yeah, what right. caused this cosmic reionization? No one is sure. Detailed observations will probably have to wait for the more powerful $2 billion square <laughs> kilometre array. <laughs> The, the funny thing is, of course, that um, there is some virtue in this expenditure because uh, any radio telescope or expenditure on radio telescopes can only help the electric universe because radio telescopes are very important in mapping the interstellar and intergalactic electric currents. So I think that once they get the square kilometre array, the electric universe uh, will have all the ammunition it needs. So there's some benefits. It's a new wind that blows nobody any good. What's the source of the most energetic cosmic rays? They have an energy of about 10 to the 20 electron volts or 100 exa electron volts. I hadn't heard of that uh, number before. It's so high that no known process could have produced it. That's no known astronomical process at present anyway. 
One particle that was uh, measured packed as much kinetic energy as a baseball hurled at 100 kilometres an hour. And that's quite phenomenal when you think of it. A subatomic particle packing that much punch. And the physicists called it the oh my god particle. <laughs> Once again, the language uh, gets in the way of any real understanding. <laughs> But the point is, and this is my comment, not from the um, article, active galactic nuclei, these ones with these big jets uh, streaming out of them over hundreds or thousands of millions of light years, <clears throat> have a plasma gun firing jets of particles from the most compact high energy storage system known, a cosmic plasmoid. Now the question was asked earlier about you know, what's at the centre of a galaxy, and the answer is uh, a cosmic plasmoid, the sort of thing that forms at the centre of a plasma focus. And I'll show one of these in action uh, a little later, so that you'll get some idea of what I mean. But the um, at present, uh, these uh, plasma guns have been built, which discharge the energy from the, a room full of capacitors, a huge amount of energy, and the tiny plasmoid that's formed at the focus of the plasma gun is about 0.1 of a millimeter in diameter. So you imagine the concentration of energy. Now in a galaxy of course it's been shown that stars orbit very rapidly about something which obviously has a very high concentration of mass. But remember E equals mc squared? You have a high concentration of energy it will manifest as a high concentration of mass. But of course with the plasmoid, it breaks down. When the particles within the plasmoid are squeezed sufficiently, they begin to collide and the whole thing begins to unravel and it forms those jets. The unraveling occurs in the central axis of the donut of the plasmoid first, and that's where the energy gets generated for those enormous jets. Okay, so the energy source the most energetic cosmic rays is from these plasmoids, cosmic plasmoids. Why is the solar system so bizarre? <clears throat> I was very uh, pleased to see that this was put down as a mystery because generally the story that you see is one of uh, once, once upon a time stories. You know, once upon a time there was this cloud of gas and dust which coalesced into or collapsed into a disk which then uh, somehow, and the word somehow re is used repeatedly in this story, uh, forms planets and a star at the centre and then somehow the remaining gas and dust is dispersed. If this were true then you would expect to see some kind of um, gradation in properties of the bodies in the solar system. But you don't. It's a complete fruit salad. And so this was a very good question and of course the standard model, this once upon a time story, has no answer for it. I was at a meeting uh, of the astrophysics research group about a year ago and one of the experts on the formation of planets uh, admitted to the audience that uh, he needed a different theory for every planet. Once again, the complexity of the standard model is mind-boggling and yet it still, still cannot answer these mysteries. So research is expecting a simple story that would explain what shaped our solar system. Planetary observations sent a sobering message in your dreams. Pluto is not a planet at all. It is just one of the largest and myriad similar objects left over from the formation of the solar system. And this is a mantra that you hear time and time again. When we get to see, look at a comet close up, we'll see an object that was left over from the formation of the solar system. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when we get out to the outer solar system, we'll find objects left over from the formation of the solar system. This is just a story. It's just a story. It's several hundred years old, too. I think it was Kant who first proposed the idea of um, accretion of, of, of dust and gas forming the planetary system and the sun. The mysteries of the remaining eight planets are proving more recalcitrant. 
So I knew Pluto may be explicable in terms of y'all's uh, story. Of course, the Electric Universe was built on the idea, it was quite outrageous, that the solar system has a recent history and that certain planets have only been here on the order of uh, 10 or 20,000 years. And in the process of settling down in this system, fruit salad of planets, uh, various electrical interchanges took place and various uh, planetary sculpting events took place and uh, they can all be traced with a considerable amount of detail through historical records which is or ancient historical records and this has been part of the work and how I came to it was looking at this and saying okay you've given, a, given me a very good forensic case for the solar system having been constructed from interlopers in the recent past, the question is, how do you form a stable solar system uh, if you just use Newton's laws of gravity? The whole thing should be totally chaotic and the remnants of that chaos should still be uh, perfectly evident. And it was this that led me to the idea of the, or at least eventually, many decades later, to understand that uh, gravity itself is modifiable by the exchange of electric charge and that that is the secret to the stability of the solar system because a purely gravitational system is essentially chaotic. So the solar system is so bizarre because it is a system of captured objects. None of them have anything to do with the sun uh, or the birth of the sun. Why is the sun's corona so hot? We've dealt with this many times and uh, this comes down to Jurgen's initial seminal work on the electrical nature of the sun. And the problem, of course, is that you have a, a star with a so-called 16 million degree nuclear furnace at its centre. And then you have the visible part of the sun which is about 5,700 degrees, which is the photosphere. And then you get a little distance above the sun and it's now up to a million, two million, twenty million degrees. And the question is, how on earth can you have a, a low temperature uh, sink in the middle of those two heat sources? It's impossible. So the question for the standard model is, how would heat dissipating from the core out beyond the surface abruptly punch temperatures up by a factor of 200 and more? Everyone agrees that there is plenty of energy to do the job in the churning solar interior just beneath the visible surface. Well, not everybody agrees. In fact, it's interesting that just recently, within the last week or two, uh, some very recent research on the uh, churning that's supposed to be happening beneath the surface found that it was only a fraction of that needed to provide the energy uh, of the corona. And everyone agrees that the sun's magnetic field carries the required energy outward to the corona. Well, the whole idea of the sun generating a magnetic field internally has never been proven. It is merely an idea which is still scrambling for a real explanation. And the current fleet of solar spacecraft failed to solve the coronal heating mystery. So now they're sending another spacecraft close as close as they can to the sun to try and solve the mystery. The problem is, the mystery will only be solved when you understand that the acceleration and so on and the effects, or sorry, the mechanisms that are causing that heating are much closer to the sun than they will ever get. So th that's, that was the eight mysteries and almost all of them are <coughs> self-imposed by the model. <coughs> These are some recent discoveries which the Electric Universe was very happy to see. Uh, the one on the left, magnetic fields set the stage for the birth of new stars, of course, because the Birkeland currents there are at their strongest, and the magnetic fields they generate will also be at their strongest. In the middle is the one I just mentioned, the MRI, of, as they put it in quotes, of the sun's interior motions challenges existing explanations for sunspots. In other words, the expected 
behavior beneath the surface which is supposed to generate the sunspot wasn't found. Another one on the right, uh, startling super flares. Stars that are just like our sun have flares more than a million times more energetic than the biggest flare ever seen on the sun. And the Kepler satellite has allowed these things to be seen in detail for the first time. The interesting thing is that the startling super flares are also associated with startlingly big sunspots. And remember Birkeland suggested that the sunspot is a measure of the an electrical discharge from the plasmoid surrounding the uh, star or the sun through the photosphere. So yes, you should expect the super flare to be uh, also associated with huge sunspots. So that's just uh, three examples there. We do not expect that there to be motion beneath the sun producing the sun beneath the photosphere producing the sunspot. We do not expect there to be convection trying to get the heat from the centre of the sun upwards and out of the sun to the corona. And we do expect magnetic fields uh, set the stage for the birth of new stars. It's actually the electric currents that do it. Magnetic fields are uh, secondary in all of this. So the real mysteries. There are real mysteries. The electric universe is keen to acknowledge them because that's the thing that uh, generates discussion and uh, and uh, accelerates advancement, I think. We must be clear about the real mysteries and not manufacture unreal ones. Matter is a mystery along with its electric force, and magnetism and gravity, all of these are mysteries. The origin of the universe is a true mystery. This is one of those which may never be explained. Starbirth. And some of this will uh, cover material that Don's already spoken about, but um, maybe just with a few different uh, highlights and angles. There is a general belief that stars are formed by gravitational collapse. In spite of vigorous efforts, no one has yet found any observational indication of confirmation. It's another story. Thus, the generally accepted theory of stellar formation may be one of a hundred unsupported dogmas which constitute a large part of present-day astrophysics. That's Hans Alfane in 1976. Now, this is a, a picture from um, uh, one of the scientific science journals. A network of 27 star-forming filaments derived from Herschel observations of the IC5146 molecular cloud. <coughs> this one was uh, annotated and numbered. But the quote from that uh, paper is, the filaments are huge, stretching for tens of light years. Regardless of the length or density of a filament, the width is always roughly the same. Now, the, the tentative uh, suggestion in the paper was that perhaps these filaments are the result of collision of matter from stellar explosions. But I ask you, would that give you that result? What it does look like is the kind of uh, intra-cloud lightning, cloud-to-cloud you know, -cloud lightning. And that's precisely what it is, really. I mean, this is on a galactic scale. The other point is, of course, um, you do not expect the filaments between the stars that are forming necessarily to glow. For them to glow, they're receiving energy of some description. And uh, gravitationally, and even with stellar explosions, you wouldn't expect it to be as well-ordered and structured as that is. But of course, with the Birkeland current filaments, they do tend to uh, maintain their width over vast distances. They have their carrying current so that they can uh, uh, cause the ionized material if it's sufficiently dense along the axis of the um, current to glow. So all of this fits the electrical model of star formation. Another interesting point is that uh, astronomers using ESA's Herschel and NASA's Spitzer space telescopes have detected surprisingly rapid changes in the brightness of embryonic stars within the well-known Orion Nebula. 
Astronomers were surprised to see the brightness of the young object varying by more than 20% over just these few weeks, since the accretion process should take years or even centuries. Yet again, Herschel observations surprise us. That's true. Uh, gravitationally, you wouldn't expect the stars to be flickering. However, if they're electrical bodies in an electrical environment, flickering is a normal occurrence. In fact, you could say that uh, the sun's solar cycle is a kind of flickering. The solar environment, <clears throat> and this is uh, talking about these energetic neutral atoms which were discovered by, uh, or at least um, uh, mapped by the IBEX mission. New IBEX data shows the heliosphere's long theorized bow shock does not exist. And this is the model where the sun and all of its planets are plowing through the interstellar medium like a ship through water, and you expect a bow shock. Well, it wasn't found. So something's going on between the sun and its uh, close environment that wasn't expected. In fact, uh, I understand that none of the models that were proposed beforehand, and there are a considerable number of them, none of them matched these findings. Some, this is uh, published, by the way, on May the 10th this year, but uh, note, uh, back in uh, 2005, I wrote, the solar plasma and that of interstellar space are two different plasmas which must therefore have a double layer or lanyard of plasma sheath between them. So to treat the heliospheric boundary simply as a magneto-hydrodynamic shock problem is naive. I did not expect them to find anything like what uh, they expected. Also, um, <clears throat> when this image on the left was published, it seemed immediately obvious that, um, as Don showed in his uh, presentation, all stars have the uh, signature of a ring of Birkeland current filaments passing through uh, what is in effect the equatorial uh, sheet of the solar wind, which is the equatorial current sheet of the, the star. Where that current sheet intersects these Birkeland current filaments, orthogonally, which is what you see here. And the Birkeland current filaments, by the way, follow the local interstellar magnetic field lines, which is what you see here. Where they intersect, you'll have bright spots, rather like a um, thin cloud moving through a ring of searchlight beams. Uh, and they will, as the material moves through, they will brighten and they will dim. And this, is, this was found also, and it will happen fairly rapidly. And that was a great surprise because there was no idea that there was anything going on just out beyond the, so the sun and the solar system that was so dynamic. So this, in my opinion, was a confirmation uh, of the Electric Universe model and it's one that has yet to be investigated in detail um, by researchers. This gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> um, the supernova 1987A ring of pearls you can see on the right, that is supposed to be the result of a star exploding. Well, the, the explanation actually is much simpler. On the left to, in, to the left of that is that little inset which shows you the form of a plasma Z pinch, and it's quite complex. You notice it has all of those vertical uh, filaments, and at the center is a the uh, purple uh, central current column, but you've got these concentric cylinders, which Don spoke about with that uh, uh, picture on the left, the planetary nebula M29. You can see the concentric cylinders, or filamentary cylinders. Now, right where the star pinches, these uh, filaments all come down, and then where the star's equatorial current sheet comes out to meet it, you will get these bright hot spots, which is the equivalent of the ENA ring around the sun. Only ours is in dark mode. The supernova, obviously, was a highly energetic event, and it had um, 
uh, obviously much more light thrown uh, from those bright spots, easily visible. So that's a visible stellar circuit. Now this is from Eric Lerner's web, or one of his websites, I think, and this is a picture of his plasma focus and it's an animated version. So this shows the complexity of plasma behavior and the form, actual formation of a plasmoid and how it works. On the right is that diagram which Don showed you earlier, the plasma focus device. So this is what goes on in the centers of galaxies and uh, so on. I'm sorry, the sound... Uh, That gives you an idea of the complexity of plasma behavior. The various forms of plasma instabilities all produce that uh, donut-shaped plasmoid. And when it collapses, the uh, particles and X-rays and gamma rays and all the high energy particles are ejected along the axis of the plasmoid. <coughs> Positive in one direction and negative in another. And I think that's uh, quite important because one of the uh, puzzles for me uh, has been how do you get a symmetrical uh, current distribution with negative current coming from the south pole of the sun and negative current coming into the north pole of the sun, how do you get that symmetrical arrangement when you're just embedded in a filament or sorry cylinders of Birkeland current filaments? The answer is of course you invoke a double-headed plasma focus, which is what Don spoke about in his talk. This brings me to um, a prediction and uh, an explanation of something which at present is a complete puzzle in the standard model, and th that's these flyers. Now Don spoke about them too, and I'm glad he did because it saves me a bit of time. Here you've got, in the left-hand side, you've got a picture of a star at the centre of a nebula, and you'll see down to the uh, lower right and the upper left, there's a symmetrical arrangement of these things called uh, flyers. And then you've got an inset which shows you a kind of close-up view of it. The flyer being a fast, fast-moving, low ionization emission region. <clears throat> in fact, in the uh, inset, you can almost see the Birkeland uh, filaments, those uh, hotspots with the cometary trails around them. The discharge moves rapidly along the axis away from the star. Well, the fact that it moves rapidly is also a feature of the plasma focus. If you can imagine uh, a discharge starting between the filaments inside one of those Birkeland cylinders, then they will fold in and you will get the plasma focus formed and then it will rush along the axis away from the star. So there may be more than just one or two plasma focuses involved uh, with the star, and particularly in a planetary nebula. The temperature of the plasma falls towards the axis, or at least the ionization level of material due to Markland convection is lowest along the axis of the um, discharge, so that's why it's low ionization. All of this is a total puzzle in the standard model. Uh, so that explains the low ionization. And this is an example uh, of another planetary nebula where you can see the flyer there. And it even shows the uh, morphology of the penumbra of a plasma focus. So the other thing is that polar cosmic rays are a mystery because the hotspots must be produced within about 0.03 light years of Earth. These were recently discovered, <coughs> coming uh, both to the north and south pole of the Earth. 
they would, I suggest, be due to uh, these plasma focus effects above the north and the south pole of the sun because you need to uh, be able to detect electrons, cosmic ray electrons from a particular direction suggests that they will form very close because otherwise the uh, galactic magnetic field diffuses their trajectories and they appear to come from everywhere. So this is another indication that the plasma focus is a part of a stellar circuit. And it's noteworthy that the plasma foci are oriented such that cosmic ray electrons, muons, are aimed at the star along the z-pinch axis. And Don also showed this picture, although his is more up to date than mine, it's got gamma rays as well. But the point is that you've got um, uh, high energy emissions at the periphery of those bubbles. It's not from the centre, and the question is how do you get the energy from the centre of the galaxy out to that periphery to light up that, those bubbles in gamma rays and x-rays? The answer is you don't. The energy is coming into the galaxy and is being lit just like the uh, solar corona is a high energy plasma. The same with the galaxy, where you first intercept the plasma of the galaxy, that's where the Birkeland currents and the energy associated with those intergalactic Birkeland currents will start to light up the plasmas in high energies. So bipolar galaxies, the Milky Way, and I suggest that a galaxy is the grandest cosmic plasma discharge in the visible universe, which tends to explain why there are the uh, beautiful spiral galaxy is a common phenomenon, common shape. And uh, that's it. I think uh, we shall hear a lot more about the electric universe as the new discoveries pour in. Thank you. We're, uh, we're awfully tight on our time. Um, maybe, maybe one question if somebody wants to come up. And then we're going to need to take a break and try want to try to start on time for the next session. We still have four more session, uh, four more speakers to the afternoon. Okay, Dr. Lucas.